Sunday mornings um, through the Bible here. Uh, we go back and forth between the Old Testament and New Testament. Most of you know that already, but in case you're newer, uh, we're currently in the Old Testament book of 2 Samuel. So if you have a Bible with you or a mobile or a mobile phone, maybe you could turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 22 is where we left off in the Old Testament. And there's ushers coming down the aisles right now with Bibles and uh uh, if you don't have one, this is a rather long chapter, and I'm going to read the whole thing. So you might want to follow along with me, get their attention if you don't have a Bible. And they even mark the place for you so that you can, if you're not familiar with the scriptures, you can easily find your place there. Second Samuel uh, chapter 22 today. And as you're making your way there, I was reminded um, when I was preparing that... Um, People really like to take a walk down memory lane. Have you noticed that? <laughs> and it doesn't matter how old you are. If you can be 25 or 75, and people like to talk about the good old days, even though some of them are closer than other people, <laughs> you know? Like we, we like to remember when we rode bikes without helmets and, and, and rode around in the car without seat belts. And, and we like to reminisce about the old music that we liked and, and those movies that were funny to us. And, you know, just when culture, our culture uh, was different. And all those things are fine. You know, my family, we sit around and laugh at that stuff um, too. But we have to be careful about living in the past. There's a song uh, they used to sing that goes, Oh, the time we're missing, spending the hours reminiscing. <laughs> and that's true, you know, that um, we have to be careful because we need a balance of remembering the past, you know, enjoying it, but living for uh, today. It's one thing to, to live in the past. <laughs> it's another to be grateful for it. And I would say especially that we would be mindful of the things that God has done for us in the past. And really this chapter is a walk down memory lane with David, King David, that uh, he's going to share with us uh, his experience with God and how important his experience blesses him currently and also in the future. He remembers what God has done, and he actually connects it with today and the future. It's like, you know, here's what, what, what happened to me and how much I appreciate God uh, because of it. And here's what I expect God to do because he's proven himself uh, to me. And you know, just as a side note, I think that this kind of attitude only happens when we experience God for ourselves. And so I called this uh, chapter, the title of it, Experiencing God for Yourself. And this is such an important subject, and I pray that we would be mindful of it. And I think that that's what, you know, is kind of the main thing or a main theme here in 2 Samuel uh, 22. And I don't usually do this, but I have a lot of points today. I usually try to only have a few, but I've got a bunch of them because, um, well, it's long chapter, but also because there's all these different ways that God was building character in David and, and his trust in the Lord um, through these things. So I want to point out eight different ways that, that God did that for him, ways that he experienced God for himself, and maybe you and I can connect it to ourselves today, okay? Well, we'll start with the first one in the outline. They'll be on the screens for you. The first one is um, uh, David experienced God for himself um, through God's presence. So his presence is number one. And let's start reading here, verse 1 and 2 of Second Samuel 22. And the author said, Then David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. Okay, I'm going to stop there for a couple moments. All right, so this is a song that David wrote. He was a songwriter, as well as a bunch of other things. And he wrote this song to God. And it's almost identical to Psalm 18. Uh, it's so good that it's in the Bible twice. <laughs> it's like one of the greatest hits, if you will. And he even tells us the uh, occasion 
that it's written here. It's when God delivered him from all of his enemies, right? So it's a, it's a good news chapter. He said also, and from Saul. Remember, Saul was always chasing after David. And, and um, notice that he doesn't include Saul as one of his enemies. He never did. Saul saw David as an enemy, but David never saw him like that. David did write this, I believe, we, as we go through it, you'll see about the hardest times of his life. You know, imagine you going through a really difficult time in your life, and, and God blesses you through that. You would want to go and tell everybody about it, and I know that's the case with some of you. And that's essentially what David is doing. You know, look what God did for me. Look how he helped me through all this. So he starts off there in verse 2, calling God his rock, describing God in those various ways. He calls him his rock and, and fortress and deliverer, those descriptions. I heard about a little girl who was in art class, and she was given this assignment to use her creativity to draw a picture of something. And so as the teacher was making her way around the, the room, she uh, came up to this little girl and asked her uh, what she was drawing. And she said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher said, well, that's kind of silly. Nobody knows what God looks like. And she said, they will in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> this, that's what David's doing here in 2 Samuel 22. He's drawing a picture for us, describing what God is like. And he starts off by saying rock. And I'd like for you to kind of keep that in the back of your mind because this comes up again a few times in the chapter. So it's really important. And if you can imagine a huge rock, what that represents, it's, you know, stable. And, you know, maybe a, if you're out someplace and you need to get a break from the elements, it could be a place of refuge or rest or, you know, those, those kind of things. And, and Jesus said a rock is something that you can build on, right? You build your house on a rock, meaning himself. And so again, those connections um, with, with the Lord. So he continues now, verse 3 and 4. The God is my strength. The God of my strength, I apologize. In whom I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold and my refuge. My savior. You save me from violence. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved for my enemies. I'm sure some of us sang that song back in the day. So what's David doing here? I think he's just boasting about who God is to him. Not putting his trust in himself, but he's connecting himself to God's abilities, you see. He even says, look at all my personal e expressions of him, you know, he, eight times I counted in those couple of verses where, you know, me or my, he's my strength, he's my shield, he's my stronghold, and, and so forth. And notice that since he knows all that about God, what does he do? He says, I will call upon him. And that's really wise. <laughs> you know, it would be dumb if you knew the fire station down the street would come and put out a fire for you, but not call them when there's a fire. <laughs> and likewise, it's not very smart to know all this about God, but not go to him every single day for what you need. <laughs> that is, unless you don't know these things about God. Because often, isn't that the problem? You know, we're, we're unfamiliar with who God really is, what he's capable of. We haven't experienced him much. You know, a lot of times Christians don't have much of an experience with God. It's so critical, you guys, to get to know the Lord personally. And that's why, you know, we got to open up the Bible on our own, not just here at church. We got to serve him, find a place to serve the Lord. That's why we raise awareness to you around here. Um, praying to him, coming together like this and worship and fellowship with, 
with, with other believers. I believe that God wants us to experience his presence through practice with him. It's so important for us. And David is doing that. He's a good uh, example. Well, he goes on in verse 5 and says, When the waves of death surrounded me, the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. <laughs> he heard my voice from his temple, and my cry entered his ears. So he's saying that whenever, you know, when everything was coming at him, you know, he's had a lot of hassle in his life. He said it made him afraid. He thought he was going to die. A lot of close near-death experiences with, with David. And so he says he turned to God in those moments. And that's just great. I heard someone say that you can't learn to trust God from just taking a course on it. <laughs> Isn't that true? You learn it by going through hard things yourself. Now, that's not my favorite way. Is that your favorite way of learning these things, to go through hard things yourself? Nobody wants to go through hard things themselves, but that's how it's done. It's how we gain experience with our Lord. Did you see there in verse 6 that he, he mentions a place called Sheol? Sheol. You know, um, usually... In the Old Testament, that is speaking of the grave, death. Uh, and that's probably what he's talking about here, you know, the fear of dying, you know, the unknown kind of a thing. But it's also a word that's often used to, uh, to let us know that there's a place that people go to that's the pit place for departed souls, place where you don't return from, you know. It's actually the same word that's used in the New Testament. The word Hades has the same uh, meaning. In other words, um, it's not just uh, a grave. And I'm bringing this up because lots of people think that um, once this life is over, that's it. There's no more. We're just these bodies, you know. That's what a lot of people think that. And they're very mistaken. <laughs> because the Bible is very plain that people go on after death. It's not just this, that we are, we have a soul that lives, right? Now in David's time, after you died, everyone was, would go to the same place. You were actually confined to, in a sense, to a, a place. And this place was Sheol or Hades. And this place, uh, Jesus tells us in Luke 16, has two, two separate places in it, two compartments, uh, if you will. One is a place of torment for unbelievers, awaiting the great white throne judgment of God. And that place is still open for business. There's another place that was called Abraham's bosom, the, the place of comfort for believers who were actually waiting for Jesus to pay for their sins. You see, the Old Testament saints, they look forward to the redemption. We, we know it's already happened. And so once Jesus died, that's why he said he went to go set the captives free. It's one reason that it says that, because he went to Hades or Sheol to set the captives uh, free, the believers. And so now when anyone dies, that and they've put their trust uh, in Christ when they die, that they go straight into the presence of God. Hallelujah. You will go straight into the presence of the Lord. And, uh, and it's because Jesus has redeemed us. He paid for our sins. And if you've put your trust in him, um, you will be with God in glory uh, when you leave this world. But we do go on. This isn't all there uh, is to it. And so this first section is so important, um, and so this is the longest one that we'll cover here this morning, that uh, he, it's important that we experience God's presence with practice, right? And uh, David does that, uh, and, and he's wise. Well, now the second way that David experienced uh, God for himself, and we can too, it's through his power. So number two, 
his power. I'm going to read a a longer section uh, here, verse 8 through 16. It says, Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and flew, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness canopies around him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, clouds of fire were kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning bolts, and he vanquished them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were uncovered at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> some people uh, believe that this is, you know, uh, some of what we saw with uh, the children of Israel being rescued, um, f- you know, through the Red Sea and uh, that whole uh, going through the wilderness and experiencing God's power in the wilderness. And there are some connections Uh, that you can make to this here. But really what's happening is this is all in response to verse 7. If you go back to that, he said, I called out to God and here's what he did for me. (laughs) And so what David does is he uses a lot of poetic language to describe the power uh, of God. Now I'm sure you're aware that God does not have gigantic nostrils with smoke coming out of them, right? You know that, don't you? Or literally breathing fire out of his mouth. He doesn't actually ride on an angel anywhere. (laughs) Some people think that the Bible is just a bunch of ancient superstitions because of stuff like this. They they think of the Bible as like, you know, how we how people used to think that Atlas hold held up the world on his shoulders, you know, that, that, you know, we worship a deity to explain everything, right? And so all this stuff is myths and, 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 and so forth. But that's not what's happening here. All David is trying to do is explain the unexplainable using poetic language. And what he's trying to explain is God's power in a poetic way. And I think that we get it, don't you? (laughs) Don't you get that God's powerful through this? Don't you get that the speed at which he was delivered from things? I mean, it's a really good way to write. (laughs) And I I just see it as David saying, look, you guys, you got to experience this for yourself. Because he's just connecting God's power to what he's he's done for him. And, And I believe that God will manifest his power in your life if you seek after him. He will. It may not look like this, but it'll be powerful nonetheless. He's done it for me, and I'm just a guy, you know, and God loves to show himself powerful, strong on our behalf. Well, the third way that David experienced God for himself is his approval. Number three is his approval. Verse 17, He said, he sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He also brought me out into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. I call this the, the he, me section of the, of the psalm. He took me. He drew me. He delivered me. You know, again, he's trying to make the connection of the experience that he had personally with God, and who he is, and the things that he's done for him. He said, look, what was happening to me in these times is just too much for me. But I have confidence that God loves me and he's going to help me in my time of distress. And God show, did that, didn't he? he? He rescued him, he said. Rescued him. And then look at verse 20. 
it says that he brought him into a broad place. You know, this um, phrase comes up a bunch of times in the Bible um, when it connected to believers that God puts us in a wide place or a broad uh, place. And for me, as I've read it, um, I've, I've always sort of pictured it as freedom. God, God's setting me free, you know? Jesus said there's a broad way that people choose for themselves that leads to destruction. And that's not what this is talking about here. This is talking about, you know, people who've been set free from their sin. I was thinking about um, when I was a young man in my 20s, I, I, I sort of had this sense, even though I couldn't, I couldn't um, express it in words, but I can now. But I had this sense that I was chained to an invisible pit that was dragging me down to it a, one link at a time every day because there was this hopelessness I had in my 20s before I knew the Lord. And there was a sense of darkness that was just hovering uh, around me. And I, and I had this feeling uh, of helplessness all the time. And I just tried to ignore it, you know, but it never went away. And I tried to soothe myself through alcohol and other things. And it just, it wouldn't go uh, away. But then one day Jesus showed up in my life. And, and I put my faith in him and those chains fell off. It was a glorious day. I mean, it happened instantly with me and my outlook on, on life. And it's because death no longer had a hold on me. And, I, and, and, and many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, well, it's, if you know what I'm talking about, can you raise your hand? Can you raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about? Okay, like most of you. <laughs> it no longer has a hold over you. And I, what I believe is at that moment, God put me in a broad place. He, he brought me out of the miry clay and set me on a rock. Him. His foundation. And in those times, it's almost like you, you hear him say, you are free, son. You are free, daughter. Now, here's the best way. Read your Bible and go that way. You know? And then we're free to live for God. Because as uh, he said there, he delights in his children. He delights in us. And so like I said, um, this, there's so much of his approval in that broad place. Because he, 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 he bought us, and then he shows that he approves of us by putting in us in this broad place of liberty and just saying, you know what? Just go serve me. You're free from yourself. You're free from, from serving sin and the enemy. And you're free to live for me now. It's like awesome. And, and, and we experience his approval that way every single day. And it's great. And I think that's what David is trying to communicate to us. God's approval for us. Well, we're up to the fourth way here in our outline. Number four is his reward. Let's talk about rewards. Verse 25, verse 21, I should say. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has recompensed me or rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me. And as for his statues, statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also blameless before him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his eyes. Okay, there's a few different uh, interpretations of what this is about. Some believe that David wrote this earlier in his life before he sinned with Bathsheba. Remember that? We've, we've, we've seen that in 2 Samuel. He sinned with Bathsheba, and then he had Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, put to death, and it just messed up his family life. And, and you know, that kind of thing just stays with you. And, and, and so people think that he wrote this um, before that, because here there seems to be a little bit too much of him trusting in himself here, you know, and, and that's possible. 
it's possible that's what this could could be i I do know that later on that he's he seems to have a much more humble take of who he is than when he started because messing up really bad will will um you know you'll be broken in a really unique way and humbled and it could be that that's what's happened here that's one view another view is that others say that david can't be writing this about himself that he's speaking prophetically through the holy spirit about the messiah because of you know the 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 description that's given us here and there's some merit to that too you know there's actually some merit that there's a number of things in this psalm that you could take being prophetic about jesus you know it could be those two Um, most that i can tell believe that david is just saying these things as a response to the grace of god (laughs) and that's kind of where i land on it i think you know he's just saying look because god has come into my life this is who i am now he sees himself as blameless before god because he's been forgiven of his sins you know and now god is going to reward me based on the good that i invest in uh, with my life and i think that's a really healthy way for believers to think <laughs> that i'm righteous clean in god's eyes because of what jesus has done for me and therefore now i can go and live for him right and not just be coming down on myself all the time for who i'm not but see myself is who i am in jesus right we have a position of right standing before god uh, through faith and 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 the new testament tries to argue us into receiving that for ourselves over and over again but i am whiter than snow because of what god has done uh, for me well he continues about rewards in verse 26 he says with the merciful you will show yourself merciful with a blameless man you will show yourself blameless and with the pure you will show yourself pure and with the devious you will show yourself shrewd you will save the humble people but your eyes are on the haughty that you may bring them down okay so he's comparing pride and humility here and you know on the one hand pride will make a person have a wrong opinion of themselves whereas humble people are those who have an accurate opinion of themselves and whichever way you go on this it affects your rewards and the way that god blesses you here and in your future home and in heaven and it's interesting to me that david says that god is responsive to who we are and what we do that god will be to you what you are to him isn't that something in other words if you're pure in heart if you're teachable if you're fellowship minded with the lord and with with others you will experience increase in your life he will bless your life i mean remember what jesus said in the sermon on the mount he said that the that the merciful will obtain mercy and it's not like one for one either you will receive way more than you give out because you know we always think we're going to do these great things for god by serving him and he totally outgives us because you can't outgive god and so there's like this this sense of blessing or reward however you want to put that in this life and then in the life to come but he also points out there that if if i insist on being a prideful man then he's going to take me down a few notches until i get it (laughs) right so it's kind of amazing that you know we have a big say in what how god like treats us and how we respond to him or don't respond to him it's very important that we pay attention uh and to do what he says uh to do well that's the fourth one number five here in our um journey through this chapter the fifth way that david experienced god for himself his word let's look at verse 29 
He said, for you are my lamp, O Lord. The Lord shall enlighten my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop. <laughs> by my God I can leap over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. You know, that statement there that I sort of slowed down on in verse 31 is huge. The word of the Lord is proven. G. Campbell Morgan, a uh, great Bible teacher from uh, years ago, he said that David saw his life with God as more than theory. <laughs> it was by experience. And, it, and he did. Here's what happened to me. God proved himself. Proved what he said. He said, God was so great to me that now I can leap tall buildings in a single bound. <laughs> but you can't learn that just from reading it, though. You know, it's good to read it, but you can't stop there. David experienced it because he did it, and you got to do it. <laughs> When God corrects us about some behavior, some attitude, some way that we're treating our spouse or not treating them or how we're raising our children or what we do with our free time or what we're looking at on the internet, all those things, that you can read it all you want, but unless you respond, the experience is going to be muddied. And you know, you might be sitting here today and going, well, I haven't experienced God much. Preacher man, you keep talking about experiencing God. I, I haven't really experienced that much. Well, maybe it's because of what you're doing or not doing. You know, these are good times, and I like to evaluate my life through the lens of the scriptures, and I think it's a good thing for all of us now just to take a moment and do a quick heart check, an evaluation on where we're at in our relationship with God and are we actually obeying him in these things that we know uh, to be true. Because here's the thing, God is faithful. I know that, that God is faithful. He will never let us down, but we have to do our part too, you know. And the only way that David discovered all of this is because he's trying to do what God said to, for him to do in his ministry, in his life. Yes, he failed in areas, and we all stumble in things, but that's not the end of the story. It wasn't for him, and it's not for us uh, either. He goes on in verse 32 and says, For who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? There's the rock again. God is my strength and power, and he makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of deer. That doesn't mean you have cloven feet, you know. <laughs> it's, I'll get to it in a minute. I thought you'd laugh at that. He sets me on my high places. He teaches my hands to, to make war so that my arms can bend uh, a bow of bronze. You know, the rock, the rock thing, again, remember, is, um, you know, permanency. Lasting. I've often joked with my wife sometimes that if we were to leave our house unattended for like a decade, when we returned, it would just be a pile of sticks. <laughs> because stuff's always falling apart. I mean, you homeowners, you know what I'm talking about, right? Every time you turn around, it's falling apart. But let's say I had a huge rock in my backyard and came back 10 years later. It would still be the same as it was uh, when I left because it's like that picture of long lasting, you know? And David wants you to, to get that about the Lord, that because he's our, our rock, he endures. He's stable. He never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he puts us up on high places, right? Like to walk, I, 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 you know, it's like the royal road. God wants you to walk up here like a sure-footed deer, you're not stumbling and tripping around. You know, you got hind's feet on high places, the King James 
uh, says. So he says, who is God? Who is God? That's a really good question. I think, I, I read one time that that's one of the, the number one or the top questions on the internet that comes up in search engines. Who is God? So a lot of people are asking that question. So who is God to you? You know, he actually answers the question uh, for you. He essentially says, there's only one God. <laughs> and this is good to know because we should stop here for a moment and ask ourselves, is, is the God that I worship the one true God, Jesus Christ, or, or somebody or something else? Because people worship all sorts of things, you know, whether it's money or fame or some some false idol in their life there's lots of gods so-called gods the bible calls them and the the sad thing is humans tend to make gods like us this is how i think god should be because it's more like that person or worse that we make him something less than we are like a car but God's word tells us there's only one God. And I pray, my friends, that you've put your trust in him. He was revealed to us as Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen God the Father. And he came to set us free from our sins, that we would have eternal life. And I pray that you've put your trust in him. And I'm here to be his ambassador for him and to offer you the gift of uh, eternal life. And you can have it right where you sit. And if you haven't done that yet, I'd urge you to consider that today so you could be free of the chain that binds you. And be set up in that broad place and have everlasting life and experience joy forevermore with your Lord one day. God's word tells us there's only one God. And I think that we can learn that by experience too. You put your trust in him and let him rule your life and you will say, yep, there is one God and I can tell because of what he's done. Well, number six in our outline today is his gentleness. Experience God for yourself, his gentleness. He said in verse 36, you have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your gentleness has made me great. You enlarge my path under me, so my feet did not slip. <clears throat> this is so interesting to me. David's looking back. You know, he's taking a trip down memory lane. <laughs> and he's looking back, and, and what he, he has discovered is that it's God's gentleness that made him great. Isn't that quite a, a thing to say for a, a warrior, a king like him, you know? God's gentleness made me great. It's, a, it's quite a statement, isn't it? Have you experienced that? God's gentleness to make you great in him? You know, it does way more than being harsh does. I was trying to rack my brain when I was driving into church this morning and trying to remember any time that I felt like God was yelling at me. <laughs> and I've never experienced the Lord yelling at me. Now, he has chastened me. Because just like you, I make mistakes and I need to be corrected. And a good father corrects his kids. And so I have experienced chastening. That's one way you know you're in God's family when he, when he corrects your behavior. <laughs> but I've never experienced him screaming at me. And Paul said that it's the, it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. When, when he wants us to change, he's gentle with it. Why don't you... Why don't you say it like this, Troy? Why don't you go that way instead of this way? Try this instead of that. Gentleness. Not only how he treated David, but think about all the things he kept him from. Isn't that gentle? Aren't you glad the things that God keeps you from? <laughs> it's great stuff his gentleness. Number seven is his victory. Let's read verse 38, and I'll go to 46. 
I have pursued my enemies and destroyed them. Neither did I turn back again till they were destroyed. And I have destroyed them and wounded them so that they could not rise. They have fallen under my feet. For you have armed me with the strength for the battle. You have subdued under me those who rose against me. You have also given me the necks of my enemies so that I have destroyed those who hated me. They looked, but there was none to save, even to the Lord, but he did not answer them. Then I beat them as fine as the dust of the earth. I trod them like dirt in the streets, and I spread them out. You have also delivered me from the strivings of my people. You have kept me as the head of the nations. A people I have not known shall serve me. The foreigners submit to me. As soon as they hear, they obey me. The foreigners fade away and come frightened from their hideouts. Okay, so obviously David's role in God's kingdom is different than ours, right? He's a, he's a warrior. He's, he leads an army. He's a king of a nation. You know, it's different than what you and I um, do. But there's victory for both nonetheless. And, and he's just rejoicing in the victory that God gives him. You know, here's all these nations coming at him. Can you imagine being him? You know, and he says, look, doesn't matter who it was. We defeated him. You know, we're undefeated. (laughs) And, you know, the problems in his life, he says here, were not just from his enemies, though. Did you catch that? Look at verse 44. He said that he even got a bunch of pushback from his own people. They were against him at times. And boy, doesn't that compare to us today. (laughs) Because a lot of the challenges that we face come from other believers, our family, our friends, those who used to be our friends, (laughs) that kind of thing. But he gives us victory through all that stuff too, because God is faithful. He proves himself all the time. It's just awesome. Uh, well, uh, at, uh, look what he said here next. This is great. Just continuing with victory. Verse 47 said, The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Let God be exalted, the rock of my salvation. There's the rock again. It is God who avenges me and subdues the people under me. He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me up above those who rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. Therefore, therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles, and sing praises to your name. You know, you guys, our hope is in the first three words of verse 47. The Lord lives. You don't have to only celebrate that at Easter, by the way. You can say it all the time. The Lord lives. Matter of fact, can we all say it right now? One, two, three. The Lord lives. Amen. That's good news. All other gods are dead. Whether um, literally dead or just dead ends, you know. And I've tried them. I remember being a young man before I came to know Jesus. I tried all the different gods. You know, whether it was fun or positive thinking and, you know, money and, you know, partying, trying to get smarter, whatever the things are that people pursue after. Education, you know, they're dead. But our God lives. And um, we know that because he lives in us right now. He's our rock. Proves himself all the time, giving us victory over sin, doesn't he? And the, and, and the flesh. <laughs> he says, look, if you will just walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You just won't. <laughs> Boy, is there victory in that? So he said there in verse 50, therefore, and to wind all this up, he says, as a result of all these things, who you are down this, this trip down memory lane, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give thanks. <laughs> I'm going to sing praise. And, you know, if you think about it, that's really all we can do for God, isn't it? 
I mean, because we think that by serving him and, and you know, writing the check or whatever that, that we're doing, it's like this little tiny thing we do. <laughs> but we can give thanks and sing praise. Boy, that's a big thing to me. I think that that's probably the best thing that we can do for God as a response for what uh, he's done for us. He's an amazing God. Amen. Well, I want to invite the worship team to come back up and bless us with the last uh, song. Uh, And as they make their way up here, I want to finish up our time in the Word. And there's one more way that we can expect, um, uh, experience God for ourselves, and it's His promise. And so we'll read verse 51 and close out, okay? He said, uh, He is the tower of salvation to His King and shows mercy to His anointed, to David and his descendants forevermore. You might want to just underline their descendants forevermore because the promise here is not just to David or even just to the Israelites, but it's to anyone who believes. And we know this because Paul the Apostle said that if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendant. Because Abraham's family is a spiritual family, the believers. He said, You are a a descendant of Abraham, an heir of the promise of God. And David is obviously a descendant of Abraham. And you and I are a spiritual family of his. And so what I'm getting at is the promises in this are not just to David, even though he had a special place, special role in God's kingdom. The promises that God makes to him for believers are true for us too. It's great news that we have. And we can experience those promises for ourselves. So just to uh, summarize here today, you know, if you really want to reminisce about stuff, remember what God has done for you. Remember what, what he did for him. Remember what he's done for people throughout the ages to help them and to be strong uh, for them and, and, and think about who he is for you today because of what he's done before. And then to be excited about what he's going to do. This is so important for us to endure until Jesus returns for his church. So just as we go today, I would just urge you to experience him for yourself. If you haven't been doing much of that, that you would change how you approach that. And if you are doing that, then, then, then don't grow weary in well-doing and keep experiencing God for yourself. Will you guys stand with me? And we'll uh, sing this last song together. God, bless you your we- in this week. May he uh, just bless you in a real fresh way uh, this week. And you uh, uh, sense his care and concern and love for you uh, as we, we go out of here today. God bless you.